Welcome to The Brain Dump, where we study the psychology of success. Join us as we probe the habits, rituals, and routines of top-performing artists, entrepreneurs, authors, athletes, and more to uncover the timeless principles we can all use to take our lives to the next level. Are you ready to plunge the grunge that's been gunking up your mind's eye? Great, then let's get to it. Guys, welcome back. A part, and that's the construct your life. Actually, I need to calm it down here. The the, yeah, the it, brain. You, you got to leave a pause too for yeah. uh, Demetrius. I'm so sorry about that, D. So, guys, this is a brain dump podcast. You know, I don't even know if we're going to introduce these guys because we've interviewed them individually, but we wanted to get this man roundtable here. And you know, Anthony, I was talking to Angelo beforehand. You know, he just drips masculinity. So before we got started, I was slamming Raging It's Machine and bangs and just getting real geared up for this. And then we have uh, the soulful, thoughtful, savage himself, Rick Alexander. How are you doing, boys? I'm good, brother. Yeah, I, I think it's funny that we the, the way that we associate bangs and rage with masculinity, <laughs> for sure. I'd yeah. love to get into that. Yes. So I was listening to Vogue by Madonna this morning while I was working out. Yeah, bro. I love you know, it. I'm, I was going to say, Austin, w- w- what I remember most about Angelo from our conversation when he was on the brain dump with us a while back was him talking about cooking every night and cooking and like connecting with these things that I, like predominantly are not associated with masculinity. So it's funny because that's like what I think of now when I think of Angelo is like a man who's not afraid to get in the kitchen and get his hands covered in some tomato sauce. Yes. Well, I think we I think we found our topic, boys. So, yeah. So who who wants to kick it off, Rick or Angelo? Where you want to get started with this combo? Angelo, why do you cook every night? I cook to create stability in my household. Mm. So that's masculinity, right? That's that that. Uh, I mean, when we talk about masculine energy, I'm not talking about males, but when we talk about like the animating force of the universe that is masculine energy. The uh, the what would you say the the primary role that it plays in the cosmos is stability. Yeah, and so my wife, I have a one ninety. I don't know how many months, one and a half, give or take a couple months, and uh, my wife is running around with this little boy all day, making sure he's not eating anything he shouldn't be ingesting. He's throwing stuff everywhere and. So there, by the time I get home from my day, there is a surplus of chaos. And so what I do is I bring the order. And in order for me, the way I express my way to create stability or order in my house is I cook dinner. And my son stands next to me in a step stool. And he has his own little fake little cooking set. And then it provides a place where I'm able to talk with him and slow him down with my speech and my energy. It provides a place for my wife to take care of herself and also slow herself down. And then my family, and and it's a way for me to connect with them. And then we get to sit down and have dinner with them. You know, I, I read a quote once, I'm maybe butchering it. Oftentimes with masculinity, we look at it as this hard thing. But the quote was, oh, how great it is to have a giant's hand. But how tyrannous it is to use it like a giant. And so I do my best to use it subtly, much like how if you've ever studied any dance, like I studied partner dancing, I don't whip my wife through a turn. I subtly cue her and then lead her through the turn. I don't push her in it. I help guide her through it. And uh, the slap love is a part of the game, yet it's not as necessary as what I believe most people use it as. It's used too often, loses its potency, and often become, becomes the only trusted tool of man is aggression. So that's what I play with more more times than not. Mm-hmm. 
both uh, Rick and yourself, Angelo, mentioned some some concepts around masculinity, stability. The terms chaos and order were thrown out, and this reminds me a lot of Jordan Peterson's books, uh, where he talks about chaos and order through the lens of feminine energy versus masculine en- energy. And first, as like you know, just a disclaimer. There is no right or wrong. There is no good or bad when it comes to the masculine or feminine energy, and it's not it's not reserved for one gender or for the other. So when we're talking about these in terms of you know broad classes, keep that in mind. But I've always found it interesting where chaos is associated with the feminine energy or creativity and free spirit and expressiveness, and order is is more tied to the stability and you know like the strength. And neither of those is good in, in the extreme, right? Like if you go too far into the chaos, then nothing gets done. I think this is Angelo's alpha hippie concept, like is is finding that balance between extreme creativity, but no action and extreme rigidity in order that doesn't allow for growth or change and in, in, in evolution. Agreed. And oftentimes just hearing feminine or masculine, depending on what side of gender you are on, that gets vastly misunderstood now more than ever. I wish I could go back in time when people actually name these energies and go, hey, guys, this is going to fuck us up for here in the 21st century. Can we get a rename mm-hmm. of these frequencies just so people are with it? I think that's why Jordan Peterson uses chaos in order. Yeah. A little more easily pulled apart from gender roles, yeah. I will say this. The word chaos has often flared up with women. They don't want to be chaotic though. Mm-hmm. Do do you do you get it? Like the so what I try to say is the feminine is the creation energy. And the masculine is the advancement stabilizer and advancement energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because- it's chaos carries like this mental baggage. You hear it and you're like, that doesn't sound good. Um, that sounds like uh, chaos and nobody wants chaos, right? Like that, that sounds like pure anarchy. But when we look at it, through, I love that lens of like the, the creation energy versus the stabilizing energy like and and i think that's that's a really interesting way of breaking those apart i think it's worth noting too that at that intersection you actually need that intersection in order to create something right so Mm. what i mean by that is it with chaos with feminine energy it is the energy that gives birth to all that is right and at the same time so it's pure potential and so at the same time of it's has the potential of being everything, it is simultaneously nothing at all. And so what it actually needs is the order to take what that feminine potential and create something out of it, I think. And and so it is the the marrying of the two, what the Taoists would call the Tao, where things actually come into being. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like infinite potential light in a room. It's that's great, but you have to focus it down and in like choose a path forward. And when you're living in that infinite creative state or infinite chaotic state, I love the the idea of um, pure potential. That's such a such a powerful concept, and it's so scary because if it's not focused towards something, then it's largely wasted and ineffectual. Totally. It's the hallmark of the unindividuated man. You might think about Peter Pan, right? It's the, Mm. you have potential to do everything. And at the same time, you're nothing at all because you don't have the, the embodiment of the masculine energy to act on anything. And so oftentimes people you'll notice like men that don't want to grow up, right? That that's exactly what's happening is they want to stay in that state of infinite potential and they get too afraid of, well, if I pick this path, I lose the infinity of paths that could be. And so, um, unfortunately by retaining that potential to be everything, you're nothing. It reminds me of the word decision itself and the root of that meaning to cut off, you know, cut ourselves off from options or potentiality. And that's terrifying because we've, because, because once they're cut off, they're gone. They're, they're, they're behind us. We've chosen a path. And as humans that were inherently as a species kind of scarcity 
mindset in uh, animals where we're like, oh, I, if I have this bush of berries in front of me, I better eat them all right now because if I walk away from this, like that's, that's my only opportunity. And so we don't do well when we when we have to start pruning away options. But I guess, you know, Austin, you've been pretty quiet over there. I'm curious as for you, as we're pruning away those options or trying to make a decision, like how do we seek order through the infin- infinitude of potentiality? I'm making up words now. Well, the reason I've been quiet. The re- the re- I'm trying to yeah, be the, smart, Angela. Well, the reason the reason I've been quiet is because I'm just sitting here humbled and honored to be even in this conversation with all these great men. You know, as you say, like ultimate potential, but not focused in my head, that describes the, la- the first 20 years, you know, 20, 32 years of my life. I mean, mm-hmm. really, in the way I look at myself is that you're possible to do anything that you want to do, but your own demons of victimhood and alcoholism and drug addiction is keeping you from everything that you wanted to do. But yet the mentors around me saw something in me, whether it be rough and kind of chaotic, right? Because my old character that we got rid of was Tasmanian devil. So there was something in that part of me that was potential Yet I had to do enough self-actualization work to get rid of the things that didn't serve me so I could move forward in a stronger light. And one of those people in my life that did that for me was Rick Alexander and taking his course in the midst of a a failed marriage, knowing it was going to be failed and him asking me questions that not a lot of people have asked me and getting real, real and I know like Rick is busy and, you know, he's not a social media maverick, but he's is on there, but he's followed my journey and, and he knows how much has happened in the, in the short amount of time. And, you know, being able to be surrounded by men like that, who can ask you the tough questions and you still, I, I don't know. I think you reach a place in your life where you become more coachable instead of pure ego. And I think most of my life I was pure ego and I didn't want to listen. It wasn't until I got around people that I highly respected that I, that I stopped and took note, you know. Ricky Alexander is fucking awesome. He's the shit. Just take a, take a pause there for that. It's you funny know, you like, said that. Uh, I was going to say that Angelo is like one of the guys that uh, really like helped me understand. So you talked about this idea of surrounding yourself with other men, right? Angelo, that's something that Angelo like really does well. Um, just sort of expressing and articulating is this idea that like you, you know, we all put off whatever your belief system is. There's some sort of energetic frequency that you put off. That's why you've got mirror neurons. So I know what you're thinking without you saying something a lot of the times. And so putting your, getting around men that embody a direction that you feel like you want to go in can be massively important. And, and Angela's actually helped me understand that quite a bit. I'm often intrigued, very rarely intimidated. I, that's a that's a great line because I think you know what's interesting and and where that hits home for me was when I met my mentor and I flew across the country for a fifteen minute meeting to meet this guy because I, I I loved who he was as a father and everything. You want to know the number one thing that changed my entire life? I, I'm dead serious. I've said this ninety million times on my podcast. Is we were at a fifteen minute meeting. And we sat down for coffee at eight a.m. Two minutes into the meeting, he looked at me and he goes, you and I, we're no different. I just got started before you with better people around me. You can do everything I've done. Stop putting me up on a pedestal. And it was in that moment that I realized that I'm just as special as everybody else. And I don't need to be intimidated or or raise anybody up because I can go do these things. And that one idea shifted my whole life. So what do you think kept you from doing those things? I didn't love myself straight up. It's, it's the number one thing I see in my coaching clients. They all have this. It doesn't matter what part of the country they're from. It's the enact that I'm not good enough. Right. And then, but more on top of that, what I did to combat that was be loud as shit at all times. That's why they called me the rhino. Right. And what you didn't know is underneath, I'm just nervous that if you find out that I'm really weak as fuck, mentally and soulfully, 
And it wasn't until I got around people like Rick and my mentor that would call that shit out in 2.5 seconds when everybody else is just scared of my bravado and my, isn't it, isn't it interesting how we, we fool ourselves sometimes into thinking like being big and bravado in that way is fooling people. But if you, if you really take a step back, we, we see through it in others around us that they're, that they're just compensating for a lack of confidence. And you're like that bombastic nature of like running around the room and being really loud and, and trying to dominate conversations. You can kind of see through it a little bit when it's in somebody else, but not always in yourself. You think you're kind of fooling people. And it reminds me of this idea that as you become uh, wiser, let's say this uh, wisdom leads to stoicism, but stoicism doesn't necessarily lead to wisdom. So as you become wiser, or more self-aware, or more comfortable with who you are, you become quieter inside and it manifests itself as a quietness that doesn't feel the need to project into the room. And so when you look at somebody and you like the Buddha or Seneca or whoever, we have these images of like really wise individuals being quiet and still, they have a stillness about them. And that, that seems to really exude uh, confidence for me, at least. There's this, Oh, go for it, Angela. So to, to play off the subject, I did not work out for a good five weeks just to hear what my voice in my head would say to myself for not working out. And what it has allowed me to do is the first week or so was really difficult. It was what I would imagine is like getting off drugs. It was that and then after that was the most highest level of grace or acceptance that i've ever been able to give myself and then i realized that i am better able to give grace and acceptance to people around me because i am not judging myself so hard and it really came for me the this idea came for me where I do not believe the biggest social dilemma that we have is Facebook or whatever. I really believe that our social dilemma has always been there, and it's the misuse of technology. And the two biggest technologies that we misuse are time and the mirror. Because time is a made-up number, yet how how much impatience is created with time? The mirror is something that's supposed to be there to help you reflect, yet how often is the mirror the most abusive time that you have with yourself? I've had with myself. I don't want to project that on anyone. My inner critic is loudest when it's looking at me naked how I look, and then all of a sudden I carry these two stressors with me. Not enough time, and then I'm not enough. And so it's really, for me, I took that time off just to slow myself, my inner critic down and quiet him down. And now I don't look at the mirror every time I walk past it. I don't know about you guys. I had a complete obsession with doing that. I'm not the only one. And this obsession with time, what if there wasn't any? What if it was all just a made-up thing, right? Or what if I used it all better and used time as a way to collaborate with three beautiful men to make sure knew what time we knew to get on the show today? But after that, why can't I throw it away? And the same thing with the mirror is I use it to make sure that there's no toothpaste on my face and not to stare, stand there an extra minute longer and judge myself for a way something may or may not look. And so that's how I've been really, you know, looking at even just technology to begin with. And we all, there's always been some downside to our technologies and our advancements. And so I've been starting there. Isn't it interesting that we all accept the term 
that we are our own greatest critic. Like when you say that to somebody, we all, we've all heard it before and we go, yep, that makes sense. I am my harshest critic. But on the flip side of that, if you were to come and say, I am my greatest cheerleader, like that gets one, you don't hear that very often from people that come and say, I'm my biggest cheerleader. I believe in me. And when they do quite often society or the people around us look at that as like ego or as like extreme confidence and people are like, Oh, trying to take it down a notch. Like you get it. You're, you're great shit. But I think I was having this conversation with Julie Holly on LinkedIn the other day, which is like, we need to change that narrative away from being our own greatest critic to turning it and saying, I'm my greatest cheerleader. Because if you're not, who is right? Like, it's, it's your opinion of yourself at the end of the day that matters the most. And Austin, I know you got a lot to say on that topic. Well, I, I just think I was talking to my girlfriend about this yesterday. We just become such a culture of soft motherfuckers, dude. like soft as fuck as butter. And I'm so over it because look, look at all the shit I've been through, right? Like the drug addiction, the homeless alcoholism. And if I talk about it too much or like I want to change my life, people are like, oh, that dude's just bragging. Like he has a podcast now. And it's like, how can you look at that on any stretch of the imagination and make it about me? No, I'm just trying to impact change. But yet nobody, you know, we're such a herd mentality society. Nobody's allowed to break away, right? Nobody's allowed, like, stay here because it's safe, right? And do this shit. And it's, it's ridiculous because you truly, you know, have to be, like you said, I love that your best cheerleader, like, at, you have to be. At the end of the day, it doesn't even matter your spouse or whatever. Like you are going to be in the trenches with yourself. And that that conversation needs to be had more often because we're we're so quick to point out the negatives and take people down from there. But when are we when are we building ourselves up, right? Instead of playing small, right? And I think I think a lot of people are walking around playing small. I know I thought about that yesterday. I think I'm still playing small. And I'm working harder than I've ever worked. And so today, like there's a different energy about what I'm bringing to the table because things are happening and I'm feeding into that. And the momentum of, of stepping out of worried about what other people think has, has, is definitely long been gone. And it makes me feel, I don't know. It just makes me feel entirely different. I've been thinking a lot recently about that, um, that fear of getting kicked out of the tribe. And I think that's a big reason why people don't put themselves out there or share their thoughts with the world or they're, they're trying to conform or present themselves in a way that they think other people will approve of. And it go, I think it's based in our evolution as a species, which is if you were ever kicked out of the tribe, if the group ostracized you or banished you, you were good as dead out in the wilderness. Like you're not going to survive on your own for very long. You could look at it both from a physical and emotional standpoint. Like we don't do well, but that fear is stuck with us, even though now we live in a world where there's, there's an, you have infinite access to other tribes. You can go find the right tribe, find the tribe that picks you up and lifts you up rather than sticking around in the, that group of people who are only bringing you down for fear of the fact that if I leave this, I might die out in the wilderness. Like you're not going to die in the wilderness anymore. And so I, I'm curious, I'm curious to get your guys' thought on that, that concept. Yeah. I wrote a little bit about it in burn your couch. My first book, actually um, just the idea that like, you know, <clears throat> You, you look at people that disrupt industries, like, like there's a certain, you have to like reach a certain level of success before you're celebrated for having left the tribe, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're thinking, when you're sitting in school and you're like, man, this is, this isn't for me. This isn't my path. This isn't my direction. You've got a billion voices telling you that you're incorrect in that. And then the only way that you end up getting celebrated for that is if you actually like reach a level of success that allows you to form a new tribe. Right. And that's Steve jobs. That's, that's the people that we know of. Uh, but I do think with the, I think with the advancement of technology and because the barrier to entry has been lowered for almost all things that, that we don't, the tribe is different now, right? We're globally connected now. And so I think that it's really important to understand that um, the opportunity to step away from that and follow whatever it is that your internal constitution is pointing you at is becoming a little bit easier 
But then at the same time, I think you have to recognize that you didn't just land here, like you're the end product of millions of years of evolution. And so that mentality that kept us alive for so long is baked into your DNA. And so the actual, you know, anytime somebody has a decides to pivot in life, there's no wall there. There's nothing for real that keeps them from doing it, except about a million years worth of DNA in their head that tells them they can't. And so I think just coming to terms with, with that can be really beneficial. Like, for example, like I'm, I'm really going through a lot. Angela's helped me a lot with, with dealing with like separating from a certain tribe and just shedding light on the fact that that's all true, like really helps disempower those voices. It's like, well, of course that's there. Like, you know, and, and so maybe it doesn't have to go away. Actually, what maybe I have to do is actually just give the, other side of the conversation, equal airtime, you know, and, th- and that kind of goes into what, what you were saying about this internal tyrant. Cause that's what comes up for me. When I go to separate from the tribe, internal tyrant gets real loud. And it's like, at that point, what I actually have to do is give the other, the self-compassion, the other side of the coin, equal airtime. It's not even about like this overly self-love to me. It's not about like, denying the tyrant. It's actually just about realizing that it's only part of the equation. Um, and so all of those things together for me help kind of take a bit of the steam out of the, um, or a bit of the power out of the authority of that inner tyrant. One of the things that I've done a lot of study on is the Jonah complex. It's actually one of Maslow's studies off the, the story of Jonah from the Bible. And many men are resistant to answer the call to be the hero for many reasons. There's a lot of fear wrapped up around that. And Anthony, like you said, um, you know, getting kicked out of the tribe is one of them being different, you know, anything along those lines. And uh, the Jonah complex is something that's quite real and is a real big part of life that a lot of us are not ready to do. And that's why not answering the call of the hero's journey is the biggest challenge for people. Most people just can't get to the starting line and begin answering the call for whatever real deep rooted reasons that that they give themselves. And also too, what I really feel is the root one of the root causes is that is the cheerleader is actually feminine energy it's what i would consider as divine feminine energy and it shows up in story after story all the way around right i love you know i'm italian american so i love rocky rocky's one of my favorite hero stories and adrian is the female affirmer right before almost every great training montage what do you get adrian saying win or i'm with you no matter what right some sort of voice that rocky could carry in his head knowing that he's there now in rocky's case he built up a dependency with Adrian, and then we see through movies how that usually causes his biggest challenges. Remember in Rocky Four, at the top of those stairs, that lady tells him he can't win, and then boom, no easy way out. He's driving around in that black Lamborghini replaying all that stuff because he doesn't believe he could win. But then when Adrian's at the house, in russia and she tells him i'm with you no matter what that's him that's that's signifying that his heart is with him no matter what and then after that you get hearts on fire the greatest training montage in rocky history i'll argue with anyone about that till i die right when he's carrying all that stuff in russia look at austin we're getting a little crazy he knows what i'm saying but you guys see the inability for a man to get in touch with his feminine inside the acceptor the gratitude and then the affirmer actually keeps them from having the cheerleader so so something i i want to just add on to that that's really 
could be helpful for the listeners. It's like when you watch a movie or you read a story, you read a biblical story, read a myth, doesn't matter. Um, conceptualize all of the different characters as being part of you. Um, and so what that tells you, like if you're using his example right there, is that that, that nurture, that feminine nurture has to come from you. Um, and one of the primary roles of your mom, for example, is to show you how to do that, is to show you how to nurture. And then one of the primary roles of, and that's also why it's really important that you get kicked out of the nest because you've got to learn to do it for yourself. And so uh, when you think about that, a lot of men who don't break that relation, that relationship with mother don't have the ability to nurture themselves what you'll find is that they're perpetually retreating into fantasy they're perpetually retreating into chaos they're perpetually retreating into femininity and so they're getting drunk or they're getting high all the time or they're getting they're like that's where a lot of compulsions and addictions they're retreating into chaos that feminine energy because they have a broken or fractured relationship with it within themselves absolutely one of the best ways guys that i do it is I have a playlist, music, just like in movies, cues me into the energy that I'm seeking. So I'll be straight up with you guys. When it's time for me to cheerlead myself, I put on Tina Turner, Simply the Best, Rick laughs because he knows, and I listen to every word, and I believe it's my heart talking to me. And then I go out and do whatever I got to do. And that's how I really get into character when I don't have it, just like in the movies. And I literally just play it off like a movie. So I, I want to touch that because you just hit a great spot we were talking about before we got started. Right. And this is a concept when people meet me outside of, let's say, an Instagram post or a podcast at an event. And they're like, dude you're pretty chill. And I'm like, yeah, like, what do you think? I'm like eating metal every day. No, like I'm good. Dude, I'm, I'm pretty laid back. Like, to be honest with you, like a little marijuana from time to time, you know, I like to chill. Uh, so my question to you, both of you boys is, can you still be true to yourself in maybe in certain situations, your energy or the, let's use the word character, I guess is is can be presented but you can still be true to yourself do you think people operate in different for lack of a better word maybe you have a better word for it characters when in certain situations mean because my my girlfriend says all the time when i hear you talking to your women clients you're you're soft you're you're very nurturing you're still push but it's so different and then you talk to the men and you know they want the david goggins experience and 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 i think in my early days Maybe I had too many characters, but I, I definitely feel like I've I've kind of crystallized like maybe just like two or three. Is that something? Am I off base there? I don't feel. See, I had this discussion the other day with my wife. Is I am authentically me based on my values, not based on what energy I'm bringing. I have a value system, and that's authentic Angelo. How I communicate that is based off what's in front of me because I'm a real connector, and I believe that I communicate to reach whoever I'm trying to communicate with. I am not trying to get people to be like me, so like a, like Bobby Knight. To be coached by Bobby Knight, you have to like one thing. Usually you have an abusive relationship with your father, and shame was your fuel. Yet if you look at Dean Smith, John Wooden, who were these guys, right? Like did they were able to sort of in and out interweave with whoever was in front of them. Now, who would you want to be coached by? The guy that could shift through and have many tools, yet a strong value system, or a guy that only had one tool, one value system, a hammer, right? And so the ability to fluctuate and, and, and shift is actually, to me, a sign of better enlightenment. 
being inauthentic would be you changing your value system, as far as I see it, depending on who's in front of you. Yeah, that's that's not the case by any stretch of the imagination. So I then play my, on, player. No, I, I I base my entire life off my values. Goals I, to me are meaningless. Yeah, I think of this in terms of the the car and the driver. So you are the driver. That is your values. The car is just the vehicle that you're using to get from point A to point B. And some days you're hopping in the minivan because you're, you know, taking the family out for a joy ride. I don't know, but the driver is the same. It doesn't matter if you're on the bicycle on the rollerblades on in the back of a Ferrari, it's the driver that matters. And I think that's what Angela is getting there is that as long as the driver is showing up, the vehicle is irrelevant. Perfect. Couldn't have said it better, brother. Very well done. Yeah. And that's, so to me, as a coach and a guide and even a human being that's just a communicator, my tone shifts depending on who's in front of me. My rate of speech changes depending on who's in front of me because my goal is to connect and harmonize people. To be all the same energy to me is inauthentic because you are only within yourself. And then you are not trying to really connect. You are hoping people connect with you. You know what I'm saying? I think there's also this idea that, <clears throat> well, so if you look at where most of our ideas and language come from, it went like Greek, Latin, Middle English, English to us. And so when you look back in uh, ancient, the ancient Greek language, the, they had what was called the personae. And that was the, if you wanted to know, if you went to a drama and you wanted to know what was being, um, dramatized, like what the characters were, you would look for the list of personae and that would be like the masks that, that each one would wear to change people. And somewhere along the lines, we've conflated the idea of being a human a person, right? Coming from the mask. And so now it's built into, who we are, that who you are is the mask that you wear for the world. And so I think that there's a master's level of all of this that we're talking about, which is allowing your essence, if you will, whoever you actually are when, when there is no mask to shine through in more and more of your interactions, because there's probably as many versions of you as there are people that know you, um, especially for the first half of your life. And then, you know, so you think about the master's level version of that. It's, it's actually learning that you don't need that mask in order to get the things that you think you need most in life, like belonging, love, and, you know, connection. And so, yeah. And so your values, um, are connected to that essence. And so your values, um, come the more your values come through that whatever mask you're wearing at the time the more authentic you there is and also the less likely you are to resent your life because mostly what happens when people get to the midlife crisis is they actually just can't stand the fucking mask anymore they just can't stand to to be somebody that they're not for a long time i know when i was younger i really struggled with the idea that you know inside of us all there's a a multitude of personalities and that we show up differently for different people. And for me, I wanted to be, uh, I had a locked identity of what I wanted people to to see. And I wanted all people to see that, but it's, it's unrealistic because we're, we're not just one thing. We're not one person. There's this, this multitude inside of us. And I love that example of the persona and the mask. It's, it's, it's just so interesting how this, thing has become twisted and now we say a person that's an individual and we like identify that as like that's that's who that person is but when you go back to the roots of like that's the mask and which mask are we putting on and why are we putting it on and that might be the most important question that we can answer for ourselves is why am i showing up in this vehicle right like if i'm the driver and going back to that example of like driving the minivan or the lamborghini why am i driving the lamborghini like is that is that to show up in a certain way because I want you to perceive me that way? Did I really choose the best vehicle? And when I was younger, I was always choosing the wrong vehicle. I was getting from point A to point B in the vehicle that wasn't the best for the job. It was the one that I wanted to project. Totally. Anthony, you shoot fire, dude. Your tardiness is so excused. <laughs> dude, dude, he, he is literally on fire today. 
Yeah. He's, he's, so I feel like we hit a good spot in the conversation because this is going to be a continued dialogue moving forward. So Anthony, what do we want to send the listeners away with today? Well, first of all, before we get out of here, pardon me, gentlemen, um, what, what do y'all have going on? If people want to find out uh, early May, what's going on? So Rick uh, Alexander, I'll, I'll spit this at him, Rick, if you're cool with it. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> so my brother, Rick Alexander, and I, over time, have been really excited to, to find a way that we could work together because we find a lot of harmony in what we do. Rick is uh, – is the uh, such an ultimate studier and understanding and translator of theory, right? For me, any time there is a theory, something very big, Greek, like going back even refers to in a speech, I go to Rick when I really want to learn like the, the base stuff. Joseph Campbell of the hero's journey. And where I... Am usually uh, at my best, or what I really bring often is the application, is how to apply certain things in real time and how to make this the integration of the theory. And so Rick and I realized that in our relationship years ago when we would have these great discussions, is Rick would bring up a theory and then I would say how I put it, how I practiced it. Right. And so what we did a couple months ago is we talked about a workshop called Out of Darkness, which refers to the underground in the hero's journey, the dark part where most people struggle and or stay stuck. And through our own personal work, uh, our own research, we were able to bring a workshop together for 40 men that was very potent and had a great response. And so we're coming back, uh, Rick, May 6th. May 6th, yep. Yeah, May 6th to present this workshop again out of darkness. And it's a 90-minute to two-hour workshop, and it is very interactive. This is not a sit there and get lectured to. Uh, there is... Uh, things that we will be doing to take the theories and apply them in real time that will cause some discomfort and it's there on purpose because if we're not there, the, the best part about going through the discomfort is that you're with the people there that can really help you and steward you through that first experience because oftentimes the reason that we are so resistant to things is because we didn't have proper guides stewarding us through our first experience, right? And so we're back on May 6th to bring this workshop out of darkness. And one of the things that Rick and I felt really passionate about is it's pay whatever you want, right? Give us a dollar, if that's all you got and that's cool show up with an open mind show up with a notebook and pen and get ready to play right if you feel that you are ready or able to do more great we appreciate it yet at the end of the day the dollar helps us make sure that you are relatively committed and you're going to show up and then we're ready to serve you as the king that you are and we're super excited to bring this back because we've already done it. And so we know how we're going to improve it already and make it better. And the first one was already a success. I've already had great feedback and all that. And so May 6th, uh, we'll be doing that. And uh, you could find that on my stuff, uh, Angelo Cisco, as well as I am Alpha Hippie, and uh, all on uh, Rick's channels as well. Perfect. And Anthony, what do we want to send the listeners out with today? What's their homework? Well, you know, we talked a lot about the feminine energy in this episode, and I think it's something that as men, we don't spend enough time looking at and thinking about. And so really what I would encourage the audience, I don't know how to take this and turn it into a tactical piece of homework, but maybe this week, really 
reflect, find some quiet time and reflect on, you know, what Angelo and Rick were sharing in terms of the affirmer and the, I can't remember what the, the other term was, but Angela had such a good analogy with Rocky. And then Rick followed that up by recognizing that you are all the characters in that movie. And for you to be at your best, you can't lean too far to the chaos or too far to the order. You have to find that middle way. And so this week, I would really encourage you to start just observing your internal dialogue and recognizing those times when you are not affirming yourself, that you are criticizing yourself and you're living up to that worst critic role that we all unfortunately have with ourselves. And then look for opportunities to become your best cheerleader. And so that's your assignment for this week is find some opportunities this week to turn that narrative, recognize when you're being critical of yourself. And then as Angela pointed out, practice forgiveness and acceptance for yourself because it's going to bleed out into the world around you. You're going to be more forgiving and accepting of those around you. And I think at the end of the day, if you get nothing else from this episode, that would be, that would be a pretty good takeaway. There's an essay by Emerson called Self-Reliance, and I mm. would uh, highly recommend it. it. It really talks about this idea of like being able to break away from the tribe, it touches on a lot of things we've talked about today. Love it. Wonderful. I can't thank the y'all enough, both of you wonderful gentlemen, for taking the time out here to share your stories and conversation. Always love when we get together. Angelo, I'm coming, baby. We're gonna we're we're gonna be in that Raptor truck and we're gonna go tear some stuff up in on the coast. So I'm excited, my man. Austin, I cannot wait to have you. Or I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna do, Austin. I'm oh, what put are we this gonna... on the air? Okay, put I'm, it on. I'm the a manifester, motherfucker. We're gonna wake <laughs> up. We're gonna go take a nice sauna. Oh yeah. Then we're gonna take a cold shower, not together. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, I got a wife and kid. We're going to take a cold shower. Then we're going to go take a 90-minute walk right out of the gate. Yes. Then we're going to go back in front of the house. I'm going to roll you a nice 50-50 spliff. And we're going to have an espresso and a sparkling water and smoke a nice 50-50 spliff overlooking the, the ocean. And just chat, kick a leg up and over to not one of those half cross, like the real cross. And just smell, you know, salmon, yay, simmer in life. But then we'll figure out what we want for lunch. And that'll be our day. That'll be the beginning of our day anyway. And the rest of it is up to God. I'll Sound be honest, good? guys. I'm, I'm feeling like kind of relaxed just listening to this day. Dude, I'm telling you, <laughs> it's, 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 it's making me rethink. My, my cortisol entire, levels just dropped. <laughs> it's, it's making me think about rethink my entire miracle morning at 4 a.m. You, know I mean? you, you are doing it wrong. <laughs> I think I'm doing it way wrong. You know, it's funny that you say that my financial advisor, he, he, he manages, this does, it doesn't matter, but he manages a bunch of money and he's, he's a young kid. Right. And he said, he said, all you idiots are doing it way wrong. He goes, we're going to have the Ryan Breedwell miracle morning where we get up about seven o'clock we ride down to the coffee shop get a nice espresso in my you know in my mercedes with the windows down with some nice music on roll a big fatty he's like then we go for a little walk and he's like then i started making thousands of dollars he's like y'all have it all wrong dude (laughs) i was like and i was so relaxed the whole day i was like so great i'm with you i'm gonna tell you something alarm clocks Yes. Beat it. Yeah. You want to talk about going sympathetic right out of the gate? My life is AMRAP parasympathetic. Who's with me? I'm ready to stay chill, rest, digest, and reproduce at all times. I already know (laughs) how to kill. Leave that for when I need it. Thanks, guys. I, appreciate it. I don't know where else to end this. This is Dude, the, I that's it. Yeah, mic drop. He just, he, I just adopted my new, my new philosophy. So, all right, guys. <laughs> if, you, if you, if you enjoyed this episode, and if you didn't, fuck off. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just had to say it because it was so dope. Uh, rate us and review us. Send it all to your friends. We'll see you next time.
Thanks for joining us here at The Brain Dump. Now, before you go, it's important to solidify what you've learned here today by taking action. If all you do is listen, then you're only going to retain a small amount of the information you consumed here today. So take a quick moment to really lock in any key insights, tidbits, or pieces of wisdom that you want to carry with you into the future. You can do this by heading over to iTunes and leaving a review with your top three takeaways from this episode. If you've already left a review, first, thank you so much. Second, it's time to start a brain dump journal. It doesn't have to be fancy, just a slip of paper will do where you can record a couple quick thoughts from each episode. Science shows this is one of the best ways to ensure long-term retention of new information. And finally, if you've got a brother, a sister, a coworker, or a best friend that you think would benefit from this episode, do them and us a favor and share with them this episode. Your support, as always, means the world to us. 